So with each stop in this story, we're getting closer and closer to us figuring out what's going on with the atom, especially the electrons. So with the Bohr theory, again, Bohr put out his theory in 1913, and he really got the physicists thinking about the way the atom worked and came up with several major questions that still needed to be answered after the Bohr theory. Like, for instance, why are the energies quantized? Why are the energies of the electrons and the photons quantized? Why is the electron restricted to orbiting the nucleus at certain fixed distances? Now, it's this may not seem that big of a deal, but this was a strict and severe restriction that the electron has to be on certain paths. And this is, this is actually going to play a big role going forward. Now, not even Bohr had the answer to these questions, so there was still some more work that needed to be done. Uh, the next major part in the story actually comes from a, a French physicist. His name was Louis de Broglie. And the year was 1924. And what he says is actually the second part of that wave-particle duality that we talked about with Einstein. So Louis de Broglie says this. If light could behave like particles... then particles can behave like waves. And like I said, this was the second part of the wave-particle duality. Okay. So in order to explain this, he uh, Louis de Broglie said that an electron bound to the nucleus behaves like a standing wave, and when we pluck a string, like what we're seeing here, the way the string vibrates, and it vibrates all over. Okay, but if we put a, let's say we put a clamp right on the middle of the string, and we pluck the string, the string can vibrate over here, and the string can vibrate on the right-hand side, but right in the middle, there's no vibration, okay? Or if you put two clamps down the middle, you can have the string vi vibrate here, you can have it vibrate in the middle part, and then on the right-hand side, but again, where those clamps are, no vibration. So what we've done is actually create something called a node. Every time we put a clamp down on the guitar string, we've, cre we've created a place where there's no amplitude whatsoever. So that what that means for us is that the electron can't be there. So de Broglie argued that if an electron behaves like a standing wave, then the length of the wave must fit the circumference of the orbit exactly. And he came up with this relationship that's between the circumference, which is 2 pi r and the wavelength lambda, he said that the circumference is equal to and the energy level times lambda, the wavelength. And his reasoning led to the relationship between wavelength and the speed of a particle. And he said this, that the wavelength is going to be equal to Planck's constant h divided by m times a new thing that we got to talk about, u where u, this is called momentum. And the way we calculate momentum in physics is that we take the weight, mass, and then we multiply it by the velocity. Okay. All right, so that's, so essentially it's like saying m squared v. Okay. Now, de Broglie's work was actually verified by three scientists, Davidson, Germer, and Thompson, in a really famous publication uh, right after the, right after de Broglie published his work, and he, they discovered, they found, confirmed what they what de Broglie did: let light waves behave like particles, and beha particles behave like light waves. So this experiment was, I believe, 1926, which brings us right to the big moment where we realize that we got a whole new science that we got to deal with. So Bohr's theory was great in explaining the hydrogen and hydrogen-like ions where there's one electron, and that's really important. But there's many, there are several major problems raised by this theory. So here's the one. 
what about the emission spectra for atoms that have more than one electron? Two, why do extra lines appear in the emission spectrum of hydrogen when an electric field is applied? And three, how can the position of a wave be specified since we cannot define the precise location of a wave because a wave extends in space? And so to explain this, to explain this a little bit, another chemist, another physicist, his name was Werner Heisenberg, came up with something called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And what he says is this, that it is impossible to know simultaneously both the momentum which we represent with lowercase p and the position which we represent as x of a particle with certainty. And he has an equation that the change in position times the change in momentum is going to be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Okay, so if you know, basically looking at this equation, if you know the exact position of an electron in space, then you can't figure, you can't know exactly what's going on with the speed, with the velocity. And likewise, if you know how fast the electron's traveling, so you know the momentum, you won't be able to know the exact position. You'll know changes, you'll know deltas, but you won't know the exact number, okay? And vice versa. So this led to a whole, this was like the last part, last straw to get to a whole new science. So if we apply the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, to Bohr's theory, we start to see that the electron does not orbit the nucleus in a fixed path. because we could not be able to determine both the position and the momentum of the electron. Okay, now Bohr, because if you know both, then that violates the uncertainty principle. Now Bohr got the conversation started, which was awesome, but it would not be enough to explain the electronic behavior in atoms, and we needed a better theory, because let's, think, let's face it, it's great, it works for, it, he got an exact solution for hydrogen and atoms that have only one electron, but if we move on to helium or other atoms, this doesn't work anymore. So, 1926, Erwin Schrödinger formulated an equation that describes the behavior and energies of subatomic particles. And this is almost analogous to Newton's laws of motion for macroscopic particles. And what he called it was the Schrödinger wave equation. Now, the Schrödinger wave equation is complicated and requires advanced calculus to solve, so we won't go into it here. Okay? But... This equation incorporates particle behavior in terms of mass 
and wave behavior. And I'm going to explain that term wave behavior. Which these depend on the location and space of the system. All right, so wave behavior. We know that particles travel like waves, okay? And so when we use the Schrodinger wave equation, we have to come up with an equation that describes the path that the electron will take around the, around the nucleus. And that path is described as a wave function. Okay, and we represent a wave function with the Greek symbol psi. Okay, like if you think about this, like when you're graphing a line and you see something like this, y is equal to x squared, you know that you've got two coordinates, you've got the x and y system, and the graph looks something like that. Okay, we could also say, we could also graph a function like this, f of x is equal to x squared, and you know that f of x means the same as y. You know, this is the result of the system. So, in Another way of describing a wave function, or another way to describe a graph like this, is to call it a wave function. And it, it means the same thing. So wave function, that's like another way of saying y. Okay. Now, these wave functions are basically how we graph, how we plot the path of an, that an electron will take. So these actually do matter to us. Now, usually... Psi, the wave function, doesn't mean a whole lot to us. At least at this point in the story. Now, if you go on further and get to get into PCAM and take quantum theory, yes, then they're going to matter. But usually psi doesn't matter. Psi squared does. Okay. Now, the reason why that matters is that psi squared tells us the probability of finding an electron. In a certain region in space. All right, and this certain region in space, we're going to talk about this, but this certain region, this is called electron density. And this actually gives us a whole lot more meaning. So the Schrodinger wave equation really began a new era of chemistry and physics that we now call quantum mechanics. And the work done prior to 1926 is known as old quantum theory. All right. So, how does quantum mechanics, using the Schrodinger wave equation, describe how the hydrogen atom looks? And here's how it does it. The Schrodinger wave equation, which I'm going to call the SWE, specifies the possible energy states that the electron occupies in a hydrogen atom. And it also identifies the corresponding wave functions. And these are characterized by a set of quantum numbers that can be used to construct a model of the hydrogen atom. Now, this quantum numbers is actually what we're going to be talking about. This is like this is going to be a big thing that we're going to be talking about. Okay, in the, in the next video. Now, uh, the only thing is, we've been talking about electron orbits, so the paths around the nucleus. We've got to switch. We can't be talking about those in, anymore. We need to talk about atomic orbitals. So instead of talking 
about electron orbits. We use atomic orbitals. And an atomic orbital This can be thought of as a wave function, again, wave function is represented with psi, it's a wave function of an electron in an atom. Okay. And like I said, the Schrodinger wave equation is great to solve for the hydrogen atom. And if you if you think about it this way, in this atom, you've got like two different shadings. I'm going to circle it. So you know that the electron is re the because of the colors, the really dark colors over here in the center. You know most likely there's greater chance of finding the electron in that region versus finding it out here, okay? Now, if this, this is a two-dimensional plot, if we were to make this a three-dimensional plot, that would actually give us a shape that we can, we can talk about. We're getting real close to that. Now, the Schrodinger wave equation is great to solve for hydrogen. for the hydrogen atom because we can get an exact solution. But it cannot be solved directly for any atom that has more than one electron. Okay. Now, since the Schrodinger wave equation came out, there's, there have been several approximations that have been used to uh, develop this. The, the famous, the, actually the first one that came out was called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Okay. So the reason why I bring this up, Oppenheimer is a really famous name in American history. He's the scientific father of the atomic bomb. Uh, Born is also a really famous, uh, a really famous physicist. His granddaughter, believe it or not, was uh, Olivia Newton-John. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Grease, she's the she's the co-star. So if you ever notice her name, Newton is in the middle of her name. That's a that's a throwback to her to her grandfather. Okay, but. Regardless of the approximation used, we can still solve and get quantum numbers that allow us to classify electrons.